Hello, and welcome in the name of Jesus for this time of worship. We are so glad that you're here, and for those of you who might be newer, we would love to connect with you. And a great way you can do that is by heading to our website at walkiechurch.life. This is a great place for all of us to take those next steps. Also, please follow us and engage socially on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Today in our new worship series for summer from the first book in the Bible, Genesis, we pick up the story with Abram and Sarai. In faith, they obeyed God's calling to leave their home and journey to a land that God would show them. God promised to make Abram and Sarai into a great nation, to bless them, and to bless all the people on earth through them. What happens in this story as God puts the plan into motion and the humans respond? Today is Father's Day, so happy Father's Day to all the dads. This is appropriate with our scripture text today as it is about Abraham becoming a dad. We will pray for the fathers later during service. Also, please consider sharing this video. It is a great way to share Jesus with others. Welcome. We've started this new summer worship series focusing on the wonderful stories of our beginning in the first book of Genesis. Um, last week we heard uh, that God called Abram and Sarai. Now hear these words about God fulfilling his promise to them 
Now, note in this text, at this point, they are called Abraham and Sarah, um, but in the story coming up to it, we're still at Abram and Sarai. Hear these words. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let, my, let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that, that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, oh, yes, you did laugh. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, here we go. Abraham, he was 75 years old. Abram, Abram still. Abram was 75 years old. His wife, Sarai. She was 65 years old and they were childless. And that's when God had called Abram to leave their home country and journey to a land that they didn't know, a land that, that God would show them. God had promised to make Abram into a great nation to bless him and to bless all the people on the earth through him and his family. And Abram had obeyed. Not because he was special, not because he was gifted, any of that kind of stuff, but simply because he had faith. He and Sarai uh, moved to Canaan and traveled through the length and the breadth, breadth of the land. And then a famine struck this land of promise. And so Abram and Sarai went down to Egypt as immigrants. Egypt was sort of the uh, breadbasket of the ancient Near East because they had this source of water uh, with the Nile River. And so Abram and, Sar and Sarai, they, they took off and they headed to Egypt. Now, if you remember from last week, God called Abram and his family to set them apart uh, to be an example to the rest of the world. So they were to show the, the world by the way they live together, what it really means to be the world that God uh, intended originally in creation. Uh, to, to show the rest of the world that, you know, that the way of the world is not the only way to live and certainly not the true way to live. That's all powerful, important, but it didn't start very well. It, it didn't start well at all. So just before they arrived in Egypt, Abram said, look, Sarai, you are a beautiful woman. And when the Egyptians see you, they're going to want you. So they'll, they'll kill me so that they can get rid of me so that they can have you. But, but uh, if you would just say that you're my sister instead of my wife, you say, if you say my, sis, my sister, then, then they'll treat me well for your sake. And I'll be able to survive because of you. Now, Abram's little plan here was completely self-serving. I mean, he really, he gave no thought to Sarai. He gave no thought even really to, to God's plan, God's call. He was just trying to save his own skin. Again, God didn't choose Abram and call him because 
Abram was somehow deserving or special, uh, anything like that. And, and here we see that, right? Right now in this first moment of difficulty, there's this crisis. In the very first moment, there's a, a difficulty. Um, Abram, he's ready to sacrifice his wife. He's ready to sacrifice God's plan. So in the story, they get to Egypt. The Egyptians, they saw how beautiful Sarai was. She was taken into Pharaoh's harem. And because Aram was the so-called brother, he was treated very well, very, very well because of Sarai. And so he acquired sheep and cattle and donkeys and servants and camels. Abram got rich, very, very wealthy. That's what he got. But what Pharaoh got was a bunch of plagues sent by God because Sarai was Abram's wife. And God had plans for them. Pharaoh was ticked off and held Abram accountable and expelled them from Egypt. But Abram left and took his wife Sarai and also took everything else that he had acquired. And they left far richer, they left far richer than when they arrived. But this is troubling. It's troubling. I mean, it doesn't look good. I mean, Abraham was chosen to bless the world, but instead of being a blessing, he treated his, his wife shamefully. And, and he brought the, the plague of God down upon Pharaoh. Now, to be fair, like all of us, Abram was a complex person. Okay, what we just saw was not a good episode for sure. But right after, but right after that, um, he's much more brave and magnanimous. Abram, he had become very rich. He had taken his nephew Lot along with him, and Lot was also quite wealthy. In fact, so much that there just wasn't enough land to support all of them together. And so Abram suggested that they part, that they go different ways so that they would have enough land um, for them. And he gave Lot the choice. He, he gave Lot the choice of whichever direction he wanted to go. Abram would go the other way, take the other direction, whatever's left. And so Lot chose the Jordan Valley and he went east. Unfortunately for him, two of the major cities in that place turned out to be Sodom and Gomorrah. And their infamy will bring them down. But Abram settled in Canaan, which is where God wanted him to be all the time, right? And when he landed there, the Lord said to Abram, All right, right here where you are standing, you look to the north and to the south and to the east and to the west, right? Look, all the land that you can see, I give it to you and to your descendants forever. I will make your descendants like the dust of the earth. And Abram, he, he walked throughout the promised land to look it all over, check it all out, walked through it all, and then settled by the oaks of Mamre in Hebron. Now, as an aside, Hebron, yet today, this is a Palestinian city on the west bank of the Jordan River. Um, there's a population of more than 240,000 people there. And as the home of Abraham, it is a holy city for both Judaism and Islam. Israeli forces withdrew from all but a small port, part of the city uh, back in 1997. And this is a contentious area, all that kind of stuff. Um, but th that's, that today goes all the way back here to where Abraham settled. So there, Abram, he settled by the oaks of Mamre in Hebron. Lot, in, this, in the areas of Sodom and Gomorrah, he was actually uh, captured by an alliance of kings. Uh, there was a, a, a survivor who escaped and, and got away and went and told Abram what was going on. And when he heard this, Abram then assembled a rescue team of 300 men, attacked the kings, chased them off, and was able to bring Lot back along with all the people and all the property. So, you know, Abram, he looks much better now. He's more complex than that pitiful episode with his beautiful wife and Pharaoh. And after this, the Lord came to Abram in a vision and said, don't be afraid. 
Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your protector. Your rewards will be very great. And that might sound good, but it didn't sound too good to uh, Abram. Ab- Abram, he complained. He said, Lord, Lord what are you going to give me? You know, God's talking about rewards. And he's like, rewards? What are you going to give me? I still have no child, no son, no heir. The head of my household, my servant Eliezer, will be my heir. But the Lord was persistent, saying to Abram, no, 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 no. This man, Eliezer, will not be your heir. Your heir will be your very own biological child. And then as a visible symbol of God's covenant, God's relationship and promise with Abram, God led Abram outside to attempt to count all the stars in the sky. And of course, they're innumerable. And Abram's descendants will be innumerable as well. And Abram trusted the Lord. He had faith for the moment. That's important. He had faith again for the moment. He will waver again and his faith will return again. But can you identify with that in your own life? In your life, do you have faith in the Lord our God? But does your faith waver sometimes? Does it return again? Do you have faith that God will accomplish God's plans? In the face of the lack of any real evidence to the contrary, Abram had faith. He had faith. He trusted God. And because of that, the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. And when he talks about righteousness, that is, it means he was in the right relationship with God. And so after, finally, after the lies, the poor character, the terrible behavior that had happened in Egypt, the crisis of God's promise seemed to come to an end. Everything was good again. But you know, (laughs) good stories have what's called plot. Plot! You know this. Um, If you don't know this somehow because you've learned about this, I mean, you know this innately um, because you read books or you watch TV shows or movies. You see, good stories all have plot, and plot is conflict. That is, there are problems, and those problems drive the story forward. And each problem has to be overcome, which uh, is then led to the next step of the adventure, or that problem will ultimately destroy the goals of the story. Sarai still had not been able to have children. She couldn't become pregnant. They were waiting for God to deliver on his promise. That promise that God gave them, you know, leave your home and go to this land I show you and I'll bless you and make you into a great nation and your descendants will be innumerable right here in this land and you'll bless all the peoples of the earth. And they were waiting, waiting for this promise. But they'd been in Canaan for 10 years and they still, they still didn't have a child. Sarai had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. Now, if you think back to the story, do you remember when Abram told Pharaoh that Sarai was his sister? And because Pharaoh took the beautiful woman Sarai into his harem, he then gave many gifts to Abram, including sheep and cattle and donkeys and camels and servants. Servants. Is it possible that the fiasco when Abram lied about Sarah being his sister then also brought to them a servant by the name of Hagar, who then served Sarai? Oh, what a tangled web we weave when we practice to deceive. So Sarai told Abram, 
I don't understand this, but the Lord has kept me from giving birth. So she took matters into her own hands and brought her servant, Hagar, to Abram. And she offered Hagar as a surrogate mother. Now, this might sound a little strange or it might even sound a bit scandalous uh, to us, but this actually was a, a common thing in many places in the a ancient Near East. They used this same procedure by a childless couple to secure an, an heir. And so it, it wasn't some unique thing that Sarai was proposing. It happened. It wasn't some bad thing or something reprehensible. Sarai brought her servant Hagar to Abram as a sort of co-wife to produce a child, and a child that would be for Sarai, and the legal rights to that child would belong to Sarai, the, the principal wife. And Hagar became pregnant. And it all seemed to be working as Sarai had hoped until when Hagar realized she was pregnant. Because then she no longer respected her mistress. In a succinct verse, it reads, her mistress, her mistress was contemptible in her eyes. That is, in the eyes of Hagar. Because, see, Hagar could bear children. And she had the full acceptance of a woman in such a patriarchal society. And she was linked to the promise of God by producing an heir. I mean, all of these things made her see her mistress, Sarai, as, as lesser, as a lesser creature than herself. In her eyes, Sarai was reduced to a, a shrunken old woman incapable of bringing forth life. And Sarai was hurt and she was angry and she lashed out, but she lashed out at, at Abram. She said, this har harassment is your fault. Abram didn't really want to have anything to do with it. He didn't want to step up. He, he didn't want anything a part of it. He told Sarai that, that since Hagar was her servant, she could do whatever she wanted. And she did. Sarai treated Hagar so harshly that Hagar ran away. Now, an angel of the Lord, an angel messenger, found Hagar and told her to return even to the harsh treatment, but the messenger had, uh, had a promise for the child. And very much like Abram, the angel produced that, a promise that Hagar's descendants would be so numerous that they couldn't be counted. This is the promise to Hagar for her child. For the, design, for the descendants there, they would be so numerous, they wouldn't be counted. And then the angel commanded her to name her son Ishmael, which means God hears, because God had heard about her harsh treatment. So when Abraham, when Abram was 86 years old, Hagar gave birth to a son for Abram and named him Ishmael. But this wasn't God's plan. This wasn't what God was doing. You remember that thing about plot, conflict? All right, here we go again, right? Sarai's plan to provide an heir actually just led to evil for everyone involved. I mean, Sarai's vindictive anger and oppression, uh, Abram's weasel-like sort of cop-out, Hagar's haughtiness toward Sarai, and then oppression at the hands of Sarai. I mean, the human plan and the human behavior was a miserable failure. It was another fiasco. It brought out the worst in all of them. Was there a way to get, to get past this? Could God accomplish his plans? Thirteen years later, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. 
Walk with me. I will make a covenant between us, and I will give you many, many descendants. And Abram fell on his face. He fell on his face. This was a powerful moment. God revealed a new name of God, El Shaddai, God Almighty. And God said, you will be the ancestor of many nations. Therefore, you are getting a new name. Your name will no longer be Abram, but Abraham, which means ancestor of a multitude. So you're getting a new name just like God gets a new name. God said, I will give you and your descendants the entire land of Canaan in which you are immigrants, and I will be, will be your God. And then the Lord gave Abraham a sign of faithfulness to their covenant. Circumcision. Every male was to be circumcised on the eighth day after birth. Now, circumcision was a common thing. Um, it was a common practice at that time in some of the neighboring peoples. Still, circumcising an eight-day-old uh, eight uh, is one thing, but, well, perhaps thinking uh, about himself and all the men who had followed him and, and had become followers of God Almighty, uh, perhaps Abraham was thinking, uh, What's that? Come again. What are we supposed to do? Right? But God wasn't done. He didn't stop. Like Abraham, God changed Sarai's name to Sarah. Now, this is a little surprising because both of the names, Sarai and Sarah, mean the same thing, princess. But there's something significant now as she becomes the princess Sarah. The Lord will bless now Sarah, the princess, and give Abraham a son from her. And Abraham fell on his face again. But this time, not in obedience or worship, Abram, Abraham fell on his face in laughter. Just a big laughter. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. He laughed spontaneously in God's face. I mean, could a 100-year-old man become a father? Could a 90-year-old woman have a child? Abraham was laughing. <laughs> oh, you got me, El Shaddai, God Almighty. A new name for you, a new name for me. Ooh, that sounded good, that sounded good, but I should have known with all that business about circumcision. <laughs> right, right. And then changing Sarai's name and saying she's going to have a, a baby as a 90-year-old. <laughs> I mean, just laughter. And then getting serious, Abraham said, all right, all right, all right, all right. good joke. <laughs> you got me. But seriously, you're, you're going to accept Ishmael, right? I mean, it, it's got to be Ishmael for what you're doing. He's the one. But apparently it wasn't a joke. El Shaddai, God Almighty, said, no, 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 no. It's your wife, Sarah, who will give birth to a son for you, and you will name him Isaac. In Hebrew, Isaac means he laughs. Very appropriate. He laughs is the right name for a couple having a baby in their advanced bodies at the age of 90 and 100. He laughs. Should always remind Abraham and Sarah that nothing is too wonderful, nothing is too difficult for the Lord. And El Shaddai, he made it clear this covenant will be with Isaac. Isaac. Yes, yep, God will take care of Ishmael and bless him too. As an aside, Ishmael is important in Islamic uh, belief as the traditional ancestor of Muhammad and of the Arab peoples. But, but here the covenant, here the covenant is with Isaac. Then God Almighty ascended and left Abram, who Abraham, who immediately took his son Ishmael and all the men and all the male children. And he said, all right, fellas, we, we got to go do something. And the guys were excited, right? All right, are we going to have a, a men's retreat? And Abraham said, yeah, uh, something like that. And one guy said, this is great. I don't want to miss anything. 
And Abraham quietly responded, well, you're going to miss something at the end. Abraham obeyed. He accepted this covenant and the new names for God and for himself and for Sarah. But, but the part, you know, the 90-year-old Sarah becoming a, a mom, well, that just made him laugh. Sarah was a princess, very beautiful, a wife, really a matriarch, but barren, childless. And that infertility, uh, a sadness, a struggle for any of us wanting to have children was even more challenging in that patriarchal culture when that really was her job as a woman to produce offspring. When God promised a son to Abraham and, and said Sarah would be the mother, I wonder if, if, did Ab, if did Abraham ever even tell Sarah any of this? There's really no indication that the plan was ever revealed to Sarah. Again, after all, when Abraham heard, what he did was fall on his face in laughter. But finally now, in, in our text, the Lord appeared to Abraham at his home where he and Sarah lived by the oaks of Mamre. Abraham was sitting in the shade during the heat of the day and suddenly three men were standing near him. God appeared to Abraham as these three angel messengers. And Abraham ran to greet them and, and bowed down deeply, demonstrating honor and reverence, calling them sir, sirs. Abraham showed great hospitality, inviting them to, to come and rest and be refreshed. He summoned uh, a sumptuous meal for them. He asked Sarah to, to bake three cakes of unleavened bread. He directed a, a servant to roast a, a calf. He took this lav lavish meal and, and sent it before them and, and then stood under the tree as the guests ate. The three angel messengers asked, where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, well, right here in the tent. And one of the angel messengers said, I will definitely return next spring when your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Now, Sarah was listening to this at the door. Abraham and Sarah were both very old. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women, that sort of poetic way that the Bible said it, but that, that means she was no longer menstruating. But what she overheard came as a shock to her. And like Abraham before, when Sarah heard she spontaneously laughed. She laughed. Probably quiet because she was listening behind the door sort of thing, right? But she laughed. <laughs> but she thought, <laughs> after I'm worn out and my husband is old, now shall I have this pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Is there anything too wonderful for the Lord? Is there anything too difficult for the Lord? When I return next spring, Sarah will have a son. Because she was scared, Sarah lied. She denied that she had laughed. Again, because she was afraid of these three angel messengers. But the Lord called her on it and said, Oh, yes, you did. You laughed. You laughed. She did. Abraham laughed. Sarah laughed. They were to name their son Isaac, which means laughter. What God is doing brings laughter and joy and pleasure and delight and mirth and, and merriment. Because the Lord, El Shaddai, God Almighty, will always find a way into the future, a 
accomplishing His plans. Thanks be to God. I invite you in this prayer of time with me. Let us pray. Almighty God, is anything too difficult for you? Abraham and Sarah followed you. They had faith, yet in their advanced age, they struggled with whether you are reliable, whether you can accomplish your will, what you want, what you promise us. As people, as individuals who have been grafted onto your people, we want to obey you too. We have faith, but we struggle sometimes. We wonder if you will accomplish all you promise us. We wonder how long we must wait. Strengthen our faith in following you and participating with your people to bless the world. Grant us your assurance and bless us with joy. And today, on this Father's Day celebration, bless each of our fathers and grandfathers. Let each one know he is not alone in the tasks you have given him to provide for and support those under his care. Show him how much you delight in his work and affirm the value of whatever you have given him to do, both as a father or grandfather and as a child of yours. Confirm his work daily so he has no reason to doubt whether he is loved in the eyes of you, our Heavenly Father. Create in him a deep sense of trust in you, knowing that he can count on you to help him lead and protect those dependent upon him. Let him know that every unselfish act of love and encouragement he has offered has been a gift that you receive gladly. Show him how effective the prayers of a godly man really are and what a difference he has and can make to those around him, no matter how big or small the assignment. Demonstrate to him your amazing grace and forgiveness as he seeks to love and to know you with all of his heart, soul, and mind. Release him from unwanted burdens of false guilt and bless him for his willingness to keep short accounts with you, forgiving both himself and others. Help him to see his children or grandchildren through your eyes, realizing that in your hands is the safest place they can ever be. Strengthen his confidence in the only one who can bring good out of any situation. Teach him how to meet the needs of his child's life, that they're within his ability to do so, but help him to trust you for the rest. Push out any needless fears and grant to him godly wisdom and spiritual guidance to lead and direct those precious children in your path, knowing he must also release them into your hands with prayerful love. Complete any healing of past hurts or regrets that may interfere with him parenting or grandparenting his children. Build in him a sense of joy, humility, and playfulness that draw his family close. When plans don't develop as he hopes, or dreams are not yet realized, open his eyes to see beyond this world to a greater joy that never disappoints, and to a father who will never leave or abandon him or his loved ones. Give him passionate faith, a persevering spirit, and a powerful testimony that overcomes any weakness or doubt as he wears the armor of God daily. You have provided for him as a spiritual leader and a child of God. So today, on special days and for all the days of his life, fill him with the best of your blessings. Now as we not only think about our fathers, we pray now for ourselves, our families, and those we love, especially for all those whom we lift up to you, O Lord, silently in our hearts and minds. Almighty God, hear our prayers. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Hello, thank you for connecting with us. Here are some next steps for our faith journey. Our mission team leader, Lauren Kratz, is collecting pasta and tissues for Waukee Area Christian Services today. If you have a donation to give, you can find her at her white SUV in front of the church. Vacation Bible School this year is Sunday, August 13th, right after worship. Kids going into pre-K through fifth grades are invited to attend. Discovery on Adventure Island has fun games, crafts, great music, large group lessons, and more. There will be a sign up coming soon. Are you interested in taking the next step and becoming a member of the church? Pastor John will be offering a new member orientation this summer. Contact the church office or Pastor John directly if you'd like more information. 
Finally, you're welcome to give an offering today in person in the offering box located just outside the doors of our worship center or at our website, walkiechurch.life or directly through the Ralph app. Thank you for your support of the mission and ministry of this church. I'm Michaela Craigmile. I'm the administrative assistant here. You can contact me in the office at any time. And please don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Thanks for joining with us in this worship series on Genesis. Um, this is a powerful story, a foundational story for us. And I hope you'll continue to, to stay with us on this story this summer. Receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.